Welcome once again, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, to Mysteries from Beyond the Other Dominion. I'm your host, Dr. Franklin Rule, and today we're going to ask if vampires exist, tell you about the first modern UFO case, report on Basil Rathbone's two psychic experiences, tell you about the first fruit of the Bible, and ask if Vikings landed in Oklahoma before Christopher Columbus discovered America. But first, do vampires exist? In virtually every culture, there are legends of the undead who walk. For example, we have in Russia, the Verdalok, in Poland, the Uper, and in Greece, the Vervalica. They share many common characteristics. They sleep by day, fearful of the sun. They drink the blood of the living by night. They have many powers. They can transform themselves into animals such as bats, owls, wolves, and even pure mist. However, they fear the sign of the cross. Also, they detest garlic. How do you destroy a vampire? There are many ways. Of course, the most obvious, drive a wooden or iron stake through his chest while he sleeps. Another way, douse him with holy water. It may burn him to death. Talking of burning, you may want to burn his coffin while he's outside of it because he'll not be able to return there when the sun rises and the sun will destroy him. And one unusual way not often heard of is to give him a puzzle, such as a multicolored ball of yarn. He'll spend hours trying to untangle it. That's because he's very curious, very intelligent, but he'll lose track of time, not be able to get back to his coffin before the sun comes out, and he'll die that way. Now, vampire legends may be based on people who existed in real life, specifically two individuals, sound like they might have been real life vampires. The man was known as Vlad the Impaler, also Vlad Dracula, meaning the son of the devil. And he truly acted like the son of the devil. He impaled over 40,000 people between 1456 and 1462 in his role as Prince of Wallachia, that's south of Transylvania. Then he too was driven out Finally, in 1472, Vlad was executed, not by impaling, but by beheading. And intriguingly, we have the tale of a woman who resorted to vampirism for cosmetological reasons. Her name was Elizabeth Bathory. She was an Eastern European countess who lived in the early 1600s. Countess Bathory was renowned for her beautiful, unblemished skin, and she wanted to keep it that way. She fell under the influence of a sorceress who told her that to retain her youth, she would have to bathe each day in the blood of a young girl. She and her beastly minions went out kidnapping young girls whose blood they drained for her satanic purposes. Finally, on New Year's Eve, 1610, she was arrested. Her punishment, confinement in a small dark room with only a slit for food and water. She died in 1615 at the age of 54, still retaining her beautiful looks. Perhaps the blood therapy worked. Now in real life, there is a disease known as porphyria. The victims, whenever they go out in the sun, start to bleed at the lips, develop red splotches on their face, and also bloody eyes. Unfortunately, they've been unfairly condemned as vampires. Perhaps their disease, in part, has led to the legend. Now when we return, Details about the first modern UFO case. Please stay tuned. Welcome back. Time now for the first UFO case in modern history. The date, June 24th, 1947. The location, the Cascade Mountains of Washington. A Marine transport plane had gone down in the mountains. Every available pilot was enlisted for the search. One man was Kenneth Arnold, a veteran pilot said to be the man who knew the Cascade Mountains better than any other. He regularly flew there 40 hours every month in his role as a fire equipment salesman. In searching for the plane, he saw no sign of it. 
but darting in the Cascade Mountains ahead of him at a speed of approximately 1,675 miles per hour were nine bluish metallic objects scudding through those mountains. They were performing aerial acrobatics far beyond the capability of any modern terrestrial aircraft of that time or even of today. When he filed his report, he said they looked like saucers skipping over water. Now, that is not to me the best analogy, but a reporter picked up on that and invoked the term flying saucers, which has been with us ever since. Arnold had no axe to grind, there were no TV talk shows to appear on, no books on UFOs to write back in 1947, and his description of saucer-shaped objects was completely new. We'd be suspicious, for example, if he described rockets such as seen in serials like those for Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers. But no, this was an unheard of concept until 1947 and Arnold's report. To this day, he maintains he was telling the truth. Personally, I believe it. Now, to give you some details about the Sterechosaurus. Sterechosaurus means spiked lizard for obvious reasons. Now he existed 75 million to 82 million years ago, about 10 million years before the demise of the dinosaurs. He was found in what is now Wyoming and Montana, as well as up in Canada. His length, about 18 feet. His height, eight feet, about the size of an elephant. His weight, one to two tons. Now he's a friendly plant eater, a herbivore. Now he lived in herds as far as we can tell. And when the herd was attacked, they'd gather together around the young to protect them from predators such as flesh eating dinosaurs. The most outstanding feature about him is the spiked frill. What purpose did it serve? Well, it does not appear to be defensive. Obviously, the snout on his nose would defend him, but those spikes on the frill were slanted backwards, not appropriate for defense. We actually believe that that spike frill was decorative in nature. It served to lure mates, just as the beautiful feathers on birds do. There you have it, the secrets of the Styracosaurus, for your consideration. Time now for the trivia question of the day, this one regarding actor Basil Rathbone. Let me extricate it here from its paper prison for you. The question, in which country was Basil Rathbone born? And a big hint, it was not England. Now the prize, the only prize, one pat on the back that you'll have to administer to yourself, if and only if you get the correct answer. I'll take a sip of water and be back momentarily. Okay, I'm calling time again. Where was Basil Rathbone born? The answer, South Africa, back in 1892. Now the man who portrayed Sherlock Holmes in 14 films was involved in two psychic experiences. The first at age four, back in 1896. His family was going to take a steamship to England. However, his mother had a dream in which that ship sank in the Bay of Biscay which is actually north of Spain and west of France. She convinced her husband to postpone the trip and take another ship. Fortunately for Basil, he listened. That ship sank in the Bay of Biscay just as Barbara Rathbone had dreamed it would. Fast forward to the year 1917 and the trenches of World War I. Basil Rathbone had a nightmare about his brother John, who was also fighting in the trenches. He had a dream that he died, but he woke up in a deep sweat and learned that nothing had happened to John. However, two weeks later, an uneasy feeling suddenly overcame Basil as he was in the trenches. He felt that John had suddenly died. When he finally got back to the barracks, he learned the awful truth. John had been killed. Throughout his life, Basil believed in ESP. He died in 1967 at the age of 75. Truly the best man for the role of Sherlock Holmes. Coming up next, Secrets of Voodoo Revealed. Please stay tuned.
Welcome back. And time now for fascinating facts about voodoo. Voodoo actually originated in West Africa. When natives there were enslaved and taken to Haiti, they were forced to become Catholics. So voodoo actually became an amalgamation of Catholicism and West African religion, along with a little Indian belief thrown in. Now, a male voodoo leader is called a hungan, a female, a mambo. The place where ceremonies are held is called a humpho, and an evil charm is known as an awanga. When someone is about to be cursed, they put an awanga in front of his door. If he's a true believer, he may even drop dead upon seeing it. There are two basic types of ceremonies. One is called Radu, for invoking good spirits. The other, Petro, for invoking evil spirits. Now we heard about a voodoo museum down in New Orleans, so we sent our intrepid, roving mysteries reporter, Dennis, to get the inside details. Take it away, Dennis. Thank you, Dr. Rule. I'm here in the French Quarter of New Orleans. Now this is known as the voodoo capital of the world. Now to find out who do voodoo, we went to the house of voodoo. As soon as you walk in, you realize this isn't your everyday corner market. As a matter of fact, you've probably never seen anything like it. Filled with everything from alligator heads to pocket voodoo love dolls, this establishment is the perfect place to buy a gift for someone who has everything. Also available are various sizes of lucky snake heads. Now if you had a headache, you would simply venture to your nearest pharmacy. But what if you wanted to get rid of that never-ending bad luck or win the heart of that special someone? You would simply purchase a box of hex remover or a bottle of love potion number nine. Although New Orleans has the largest concentration of voodoo worshipers, the ancient art is practiced all over the world, and each place is a little bit different. For instance, in the Brazilian altar, the central figure is Omalu, the Aruba god of smallpox, fever, and epidemic diseases. In addition to curing and causing these sicknesses, he can also rid individuals of evil spells cast against them. To perform this ritual, you would pop a quart of popcorn on Sunday, and on Monday, before eating anything, spread it over your naked body while praying to Omalu. You would then sweep the popcorn up and spread it on a deserted crossroads. There's also the Haitian altar, which favors the supreme and most powerful voodoo god, Dembala. There are those in Mexico who worship the Day of the Dead altar. While all voodoo practices have their dark side, some lean more towards devil worship than others. Another form of voodoo is witchcraft, which is practiced throughout Europe. Their god is a goat and two evil snakes. In the back room at the House of Voodoo works Madam Miriam. If you wanted to take a sneak peek at things to come, a bone reading just may do the trick. This process involves six bones which represent people in your life and six stones representing circumstances and situations. You can also receive anything from a palm reading to a vast number of powerful voodoo rituals. Well, there you have it, some of the amazing facts on voodoo. Now, whether you choose to believe it or not is entirely up to you. Back to you, Dr. Rule. Thank you very much, Dennis. Another excellent report. Turning now to the mystery of the forbidden fruit of the Garden of Eden. No, it was not necessarily an apple. The apple came about because Greek translators assumed that was the fruit because their own love goddesses had the apple as their symbol. It did grow at that time, but it's just one of many candidates. Another possibility is certainly the fig because Adam and Eve did don fig leaves in the Garden of Eden. Another possibility, of course, is the date, which grew in the Mideast 5,000 years ago. Another candidate, the olive also grew in the Mideast, also was mentioned in hieroglyphics. Indeed, they described how to extract olive oil for cooking purposes. Another possibility is the pear, surprisingly. The Sumerians believed that if you ate a pear a day, you'd keep the doctor away. Another possibility is the plum. In the hanging gardens of Babylon, plums grew and were believed to possess medicinal power. And finally, we have a candidate, the banana. Surprising, the Quran named specifically the banana as that fruit of the Bible. 
But you've heard the evidence. These are the candidates. You decide which was the forbidden fruit of the Garden of Eden. Now, we recently heard about an amazing device called the Spring Walker that allows people to hop in the air like kangaroos. So we sent our intrepid reporter, Carol, out to get the inside details. Take it away, Carol. I'm standing here with the inventor of the Spring Walker, here to describe what's going on behind us. Um, I'm John Dick, and th this is my partner here, Bruce Krapischetz. He's putting on the protective gear for the Spring Walker. He puts on gear that was actually developed for skateboard use. The Spring Walker was developed in response to my own childhood dreams of the idea of an amplified man. Uh, we have all kinds of machines that fly, machines that roll, but we don't have machines that run fast. You've never seen someone run faster than they can in their sneakers. And with the Spring Walker, Bruce can move each leg side to side and forward and back as he pleases. These motions are transmitted directly to the external leg. When he pushes, that action is actually enhanced by a leverage ratio of about two to one, so that the force on the ground is actually twice that which he pushes with his foot. The most obvious application for the spring walker is for jogging around the block. It really allows you to maximize your cardiovascular workout. And at the same time, the spring walker absorbs the impact with the springs, therefore preventing the damage that occurs to the knees and ankles normally associated with uh, jogging down your street. Who knows? Could be the thinnest craze of the 90s. Thank you very much, Carol. A superb report. I personally believe these spring walkers will have application in space when explorers and other planets will have to move fast in some cases. Coming up next, the mystery of Vikings in Oklahoma. Did they beat Christopher Columbus to America? Find out when we return. Welcome back. Time now to investigate the mystery of Vikings in Oklahoma. The Vikings were probably the world's greatest explorers. They explored Germany, France, Italy, Sicily, Africa, and other parts of the world. In fact, Normandy in France is actually named after the Norsemen. Now, it is believed that Leif Erikson, around 1000 AD, established a colony in the New World that he called Vinland because of its wealth of grapes. That may have been in present-day Labrador, Nova Scotia, or Newfoundland. Four Viking ships were stationed in port. They then decided to return home. Two ships made it back home. One ship sank, and the destination of the fourth ship is unknown. One possibility is it sailed down the Atlantic coast of America, around Florida, and reached the mouth of the Mississippi, where New Orleans is today. At that point, the Vikings took out longships that they brought with them, or else acquired and barter with the Indians. They traveled up the Mississippi River, linked onto the Arkansas River, finally into the Pateau River, and ultimately into Hevener, Oklahoma. Why Hevener? because in Hevener is found a titanic monolithic sandstone slab. It's 12 feet tall, and inscribed in its center are eight rooms or ancient Scandinavian symbols. It has been studied by many experts. They've concluded, first of all, that it's authentic. Secondly, that that inscription transcribes as the date, November 11th, 1012 AD. Could this rune stone have been left by sailors from that fourth missing ship? If so, then it would confirm that Vikings reached Middle America 
almost 500 years before Christopher Columbus discovered the new world. Now, if you've seen any strange markings or anything else of an intriguing nature, please call us at our toll-free 800 number. That's 1-800-45-RULE, R-U-E-H-L. Now, until next time, may the power of the universe be with you. Be with you. Be with you. Be with you.